we were talking about speed the other day and distance. And the question is, is there a difference between speed and velocity? You know, we talk about the speed of light and the velocity of light, which is true. I mean, is there a difference? Uh, can we use those terms interchangeably? Okay. And so in order to get to the bottom of it, we got to go back to almost the 17th century, pretty much there. Why? Because that's when a revolution occurred, known as the scientific revolution. And you had people of the caliber of Newton and Leibniz uh, in Germany, Leibniz, uh, Newton in England, and they invented the calculus. And before they could invent the calculus, they had to have a reason for inventing it. And so they were developing some math, some new math in those days. French and the uh, British and the Germans, they were all trying to uh, solve some problems related to motion. And so they started investigating these things from a mathematical point of view, and they came up with some fancy things that today would have garnered them a Nobel Prize, okay? And so what is uh, velocity? Well, here you have a, uh, an idea. Here we have Mr. Leibniz and Mr. Newton. They were contemporaries. And um, what is velocity? Well, in order to get to velocity, uh, really instantaneous velocity, it's better to say that whole phrase, instantaneous velocity, the whole term, okay? Uh, because it's different than average velocity, okay? And I'm not here to uh, teach math. We don't do math here. I just want to show because some people are going to say, Bill, I thought you didn't do math and you're doing math. No, no, we're not going to do math, okay? What I'm going to show you is the procedure that these people followed and why we ended up with mathematical physics today, so-called physics. You know, it's mathematical with quotations, something called physics, right? And it comes from this. They, they were trying to solve some problems. What were they trying to solve? Well, they were trying to figure out, among other things, you know, instantaneous velocity. And what was that? Well, they said, let's start with uh, average velocity. And so you take that curve there, the black one that's in the center, which is a curve, like an S. And that curve, if you chop off two points on it, right, one on the bottom, one on uh, arbitrarily, right, you just chop it at one point and at another point, and you draw that blue line between them, right, straight line, uh, well, you can calculate, uh, uh, you know, the starting point, which you can say it's uh, that's in the initial position of whatever is moving, okay, at certain time. And then you end up at another position at a different time. And you take that straight line, okay? And what you do is subtract uh, the, posi the ending position. Uh, you subtract the, the beginning position. You take the ending time, you subtract the beginning time, and you do a division, you get the average velocity. Very simple stuff, really, okay? Okay, so that's more or less how they started. And from there, they moved on to trying to figure out the instantaneous velocity. What the hell was that? Well, that was a given point on the curve. Okay, and here I uh, arbitrarily selected a point, okay? And you got to think of this as uh, putting a circle that begins and ends in that point, on that point, okay? You draw the uh, radius of that circle from that point to the, to the center of the circle, and uh, you put a tangent. Tangent is perpendicular to that radius, okay? And that tangent, okay, that's going to be the slope of that curve. And you can do the same thing we did just now. You take the beginning point, the ending point, subtract one from the other. You calculate that value, right? And what you do is take what is known as the limit, okay? the limit of that product that you just had there. What are we talking about? We're saying that if you move along that tangent where you see the purple uh, uh, tangent, uh, the X on the right-hand side and the T on the right-hand side, if you move along that T downwards to the point, the closer you get to the point, the more you approximate, right, the instantaneous velocity. Okay, it's known as taking the limit of t as a approach is zero of the difference in position over the difference in time. That's conceptually what these people were doing. Okay, so that was the velocity. Okay, so velocity is a calculation, and it's already got some problems there. And let me tell you what the problems are. The first one is that there is no such thing as position in mathematics, in the religion of mathematics, especially mathematical physics. Okay, there's no such thing as position. Because when someone says position, everybody thinks in, you know, a static concept like location, like you're standing still, I'm at this position. And that's not the concept at all. Mathematics has no use for static concepts. Okay? Mathematics are all dynamic concepts. Deals only with adverbs, no adjectives. Okay? And what are we saying? We're saying that you need two coordinates to get to that position. So you have one trace and another trace, you know, uh, a uh, pair there of traces and you end at a position. That's what a position is in mathematics. It's a, um, a pair of uh, numbers, okay? And so that's one position. The other one is another position. How do you locate the position with two or maybe even three coordinates? What's a coordinate? It's an itinerary. It's not a line 
You see a line, that's what they put, but what you're looking at is an itinerary. They're counting the paces that the pirate has to take to reach the treasure chest. Okay? So both position and coordinates and vectors and uh, dimensions, they're all the same thing. They're all itineraries. There is no such thing as distance in mathematics. Okay? Distance is distance traveled. Distance is not separation, gap, okay? chasm. That's not what distance is. Distance is unrolling the front of your measuring tape. It's a dynamic concept. It's distance traveled, displacement. Okay, so none of the concepts of mathematics are static concepts. Okay, and velocity is is a weird one because uh, especially instantaneous velocity. Why? Because you're looking at a point, and you're looking at one cross section of time. But there is no such monster as a cross section of time in mathematics because time involves at least two frames of the movie. If you talk about one second, you've already covered two, two frames at least, a starting point and an ending point. There's no such thing as one frame time, which is what they're trying to do with velocity. They're trying to calculate the value when you reach, uh, when you approach zero, zero time. But you never, you never get to zero time. You only approach it so that you can calculate and find out what the velocity is, uh, the value that you want to calculate. That's going to be the velocity at that point. But you never get there because if you got there, you got zero, and then you can't divide by zero, which is time uh, final minus time initial. You can't have zero. Otherwise, you're dividing by zero, and that gives you what infinity, according to the mathematicians. Okay, so you can't do that. So you approach zero, you never get there. There is no such thing as a static time, static position, uh, uh, or static uh, separation like uh, distance, true distance, physical distance. No such monster in mathematics. Mathematics, everything is motion. And you have to get that through your thick skull right off the bat. Otherwise, you're, you're going to be lost when you try to give a physical interpretation. Okay. okay. Um, here we have uh, another uh, version of this so that we can compare velocity against speed. What is the difference? Okay, let me put this over here. <clears throat> Instantaneous velocity, which we just uh, mentioned. Rate of change of position with respect to time. What was position? It was a dynamic concept. Okay, because they're talking about rate of change of position, but each position requires two or three coordinates to get, or you could even do it with one, I guess, you know. Uh, you're looking at motion for each position, and they're going to they're gonna look at these two positions of something that moved, okay, and how much time it took. Okay, so they're going to look at the rate of change of position with respect to time. What is instantaneous? <laughs> well, there, there we run into the problem for sure. It says instant value of time t. No such monster in, 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 in physics. You can't have instant time, a cross-section of time. You can't have a single frame of time. Time requires at least two frames conceptually. That's why you have to define these terms, something the mathematicians never did. Who was it? Uh, Newton, who used time quite a bit, and then he says, oh, by the way, uh, I don't define time, space, motion, etc., because we all know what it is. That's what he says in his scolium, <laughs> the beginning of his uh, seminal book, okay? Principia. Uh, okay, so what is speed? Well, speed is the same thing as velocity, but without the direction. Okay, so distance first, distance traversed or traveled. It's not distance. It's the unrolling of the measuring tape. You've got some motion of the end of the tape. You're counting meters, feet, whatever, five feet. What you did is take the standard, the foot, and you put five of those. Okay, that's what distance is in mathematics. Distance is not empty space between the table and the chair. Distance is how many feet are there between this table and the chair? It's distance traveled okay, or traversed. Speed, what is it? Time rate of displacement. You have to have displacement for you to use the word speed in mathematics. And what is displacement? Is it distance? Yeah, in mathematics it is because displacement and distance traveled is the same thing. They don't have distance. They don't have just qualitative separation gap. Okay. They don't have distance in mathematics. No such thing as a static concept in mathematics. Okay, So uh, what is velocity? Well, velocity is speed plus direction. You take direction away, you have speed. Okay, We got that in general. Okay, uh, You can review the tape later. <laughs> Rewind the tape and see it again if you haven't caught up. OK, let me continue then. Um, so here is, uh, so what do we have? Speed of light or velocity of light? Well, let's find out. Here we have, uh, come on. Give me a second here. Fell overboard. <laughs> Sometimes I have this. It falls on the other side with this. Okay, here it is. So what is the speed of light? 300,000 kilometers per second. And what is the velocity of light? 
Well, it's also 300,000 kilometers per second. Looks like uh, they're equal, right? Especially when uh, they say that light travels at a constant speed or velocity. If it travels at a constant pace, constant rate, uh, never changes, okay? Or at least in a vacuum, right? Um, then uh, the, the velocity and the speed should be the same, right? Uh, let's find out. First of all here, let's plot it. Okay, there you see the speed of light and it should be a straight line, right? So if it's speed or velocity, really there should be no difference between those two here. Okay, and um, so we look up to see what the, whether it's true that it's a constant, right? And these are some uh, testimonies out there from people from, um, uh, I guess from uh, reliable sources, more or less. Okay, and they all say the same thing. Uh, what does the American Museum of Natural History talking about Einstein and all these other people? They said the speed of light is constant and does not depend on the speed of the light source. That essentially comes from uh, Mr. Einstein, who more or less uh, proved that to the, his buddies, the mathematicians. Okay, um, another side, uh, the physics fact, Riverside. The speed of light in vacuum is exactly blah blah blah, three hundred thousand kilometers per second. Okay, is C a constant? Yes. No doubt about it in their minds, okay. The speed of light in a vacuum, commonly denoted C, little c, right, is a universal physical what? Constant, okay, so we got it right. Little c is a constant. The velocity of light, the speed of light is a constant out there in the vacuum, in, in outer space, okay. And, um, and yeah, value is 300,000 kilometers per second, more or less, okay? uh, rounding off is 299 something, okay. So we got that straight. Uh, Light travels at a constant speed in the vacuum. Straightforward. But we got a major problem then. Major, major problem. Okay. And here's the problem. Okay, here we have Mr. Einstein says that light curves in outer space when it uh, encounters mass. And we have masses all over the place because even one hydrogen atom is mass, has mass, and uh, weighs down space time. And if, it, if one atom of hydrogen weighs down space-time, light, a little photon that goes around it, is uh, curved in its, um, in its uh, trajectory. It's deflected from a straight line path, from a rectilinear path, as you see there. It's curving around. Okay, this comes from NASA. Okay, and so what happened when light is bent, uh, uh, curved, warped, deflected, however you want to say it, by gravity? In other words, gravity bends space-time, and here you have that little photon, or maybe it's a wave, I don't know, you tell me, and it goes around. Well, like it says there, when speed of an object is changing, it has an acceleration. I don't know if that sank in, but let me just clarify it in case it didn't. I thought we just said that light travels at a constant speed, 300,000 kilometers per second, in outer space, in the vacuum. And now we're saying that when light reaches the sun, like here's uh, proof evidence that people like to have. Okay, here it is. Here we have Mr. Arthur Eddington, 1919. He proved to the world that Einstein was great. Why? Because he was able to show that um, light from a star behind the sun curves around the sun and reaches our eye. Okay, that's what he proved with his camera. Okay, they went out into the middle of the ocean and we were able to film this during an eclipse. And so the issue here is that, uh, and this is one of the proofs of, one of the major proofs, in fact, the first proof of general relativity, by the way, okay? But uh, what we're saying here is that if light travels at a constant speed, it travels at 300,000 kilometers per second, rounding off, right? And now we're going to force that photon or that wave to curve. Well, now it's going to have to accelerate, just like it says there, when the speed of an object is changing, it has an acceleration, okay? And it's going to change whenever it encounters an object. It's moving around. It's curving. It's no longer going straight. Okay, I hope uh, people are following me. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we have a problem because now we have light traveling at not only different speeds, but a faster speed than light. I thought light traveled at a constant speed in the vacuum. And now we're saying, now Einstein is saying, well, by the way, you know, it does curve around. And when it curves around, we have acceleration. So if light, the little photon accelerated, it's now traveling at 301 kilom uh, kilometers per second. Or maybe 305, maybe 310, who knows? So uh, why is this somewhat of a problem? Well, here you see it, uh, Mr. Einstein. He put it in his equation, 1915. And you can see on the right-hand side there, you see a little C there that I circled. And he treated that as a constant. But he should have known, like all mathematicians should have known, that that little C is not a constant. 
especially if he's going to talk about warp space, warp time, warp space time. Okay, now you've got a curve, now you've got an acceleration, okay, and you see it there on the bottom. So uh, we have a problem between speed and velocity, because speed is okay, because uh, speed is without a direction, so you say the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. Okay, granted. How about velocity? Well, the velocity now changed, the velocity of light, because if it's going to go through a curve, the thing accelerated, and if we do what we did at the beginning and calculate the instantaneous velocity, we should have a value greater than 300,000 kilometers per second little c. So we have a contradiction. And that's not the only contradiction. Let me give you another one just there. And it's got to do with that big G on the right upper right hand corner. You see that big G? 8 pi big G? That big G stands for the gravitational constant. That was determined by this gentleman. His name was uh, Cavendish, Henry Cavendish, okay, with his torsion balance. Okay, he, was, he tried to determine, he apparently succeeded in determining the value of G. A lot of people question that, but well, in general, this is what is used today. Torsion balance is to this day used to determine the value of G. And you say, well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that um, Mr. Einstein made it very clear, absolutely very clear that in general relativity, you can only apply it out there in the macro world. You cannot apply it to this, you know, a pencil or a pen falling to earth. You cannot use his equations here at this level. You're talking about big distances, big masses. That's how his equation works. The equation does not work at this level. There is no curvature here to such a degree that would force this, you know, the space time. I mean, what's warping the space here in such a way that this falls to the ground? No way. And so Einstein said, look, this equation is for out there. It's not for the micro world. Micro world meaning anything within Earth, like a pencil falling to the ground. That's why that's trying to, uh, who treats that? Well, it's uh, quantum mechanics that tries to treat, uh, deal with uh, quantum, uh, with gravity at this level. Out there, you can use Einstein's equation. But the gravitational constant was determined down here by Mr. Cavendish in his torsion balance. And it's still to this day determined here on Earth with a torsion balance. So we have this torsion balance determined G here in our micro world. And Einstein takes that little, that G, that big G, and uses it to calculate something out there in the middle of space at the solar system, uh, star, uh, galactic levels. We got a little problem there because uh, can we be sure that he can use that as a constant? So we have problem with those two constants, with big G and little c. Okay, little c cannot be a constant in warp space, and big G cannot be used out there because it's determined down here. Okay, I hope I made my point there. We got a problem with uh, with this with Einstein's reasoning, and not only Einstein's. All these mathematicians they they should be aware of this. They're not that stupid. They should be aware that you can't use big G and C just just to do your calculations. Say, oh, here here's the solution. Okay, uh, we got a problem with that because uh, you know because of what I just said. You can't use the little C as a constant in curved space, and you can't use G out there in the macro world because it's determined in the micro world. Okay, okay so. Um, <clears throat> um, here, let me show you this. So what's the issue? Where does all this problem come from? It comes from the fact that we started on the wrong foot in the 17th century with people like Leibniz and Newton, even before them, Galileo and others. You know, What happened is people uh, took us on the wrong path. They said science, physics, is about math and experiments. And so they said, how do you confirm the equation? Well, you confirm it with an experiment. Well, you can confirm an, an equation because what you do is measure during an experiment and you turn that measurement into some kind of equation that is what? A description of what happened. We still don't have an explanation. You don't have a mechanism because for mechanisms and explanations, you need objects. You have to make a movie of what's happened. And they can't do that because they can't see or touch the invisible entities Mother Nature uses to do gravity, magnetism, etc. Okay, so this is where the problem is. And so because they could not solve the real problems of physics, the mechanisms with their equations, they took science along the direction of mathematics. And they said, well, science is uh, doing experiments, measuring, and putting out equations. And so today, everybody, you know, for 400 years has been repeating that, saying that physics and science is all about measurement and equations, and obviously observation of an experiment, when we don't have any explanations for how this universe runs. You won't find a rational explanation out there, okay? And so this is where it starts. Uh, what is physics about? 
And here we have some definitions that we have today. This is what we ended up with after, what, about 400 years now, if not a little more. Physics, the branch of science concerned with the nature and properties of matter and, what is that? Energy? What the hell is energy? I mean, I don't know what physics is until I know what energy is. Is that what they're saying? I need to know what this fancy word energy is in order to understand what physics is all about. Okay, the subject matter of physics includes mechanics. Okay, and hopefully, you know, uh, we want to see mechanics, okay, uh, some kind of mechanism. So we need to figure out what mechanism, what a mechanism is. Can we do mechanisms with equations, with variables, with numbers? Or do we need physical objects to do mechanism, to show someone what the mechanism of something is? Okay, this is the, the issue. Okay, and it's interesting to say the structure of atoms. And mathematics doesn't deal with structure at all. In fact, mathematics doesn't care, like, uh, what the structure of the atom is. Because they're just going to describe motion. They're not going to deal with structure. They're going to deal with the only thing mathematics deals with, which is motion. How something moves, not what it is. Math does not deal with structure. And they say energy. We'll find out in a minute what energy is. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get to know what physics is about because we can't know what physics is about until we know what energy is about, okay, or what it is. And uh, that was from the Oxford Dictionary. Wikipedia says physics is the natural science that studies. No, in, in science we don't study. Anyone can study and be ignorant. Uh, in science, we're not ignorant. In science, we have to produce a theory, okay, an explanation for something. If you just studied and don't have an explanation, you're not a scientist. So, no, physics, science, they're not about studying. Anybody can study and get a zero on the test. So, uh, studies matter, okay? It's fundamental constituents, okay? I don't think that's the case because uh, they don't care what the constituents are. They don't deal with objects at all. It's motion and behavior. Yeah, they deal with that, okay? Through space and time. Time? What do you mean through time? Is time a medium? Like an ocean? Is that what time is? Like air? You move through time? You move through space also? Space is nothing. How can you move through nothing? I mean, I'm, uh, I think it's easy to move through nothing. Try to move through something, you know, through, <laughs> through water or air. But to move through nothing, I don't know how you can do that, okay? Especially if you haven't defined what nothing is. And the related what? Entities, entities of energy? Energy is an entity? Force? Force is also an entity? What kind of entities are these? See, they, they're reifying these, these words. They're turning these concepts into physical objects making them concrete, okay, so they're solid, okay. Okay, here we have a uh, um, uh, book I've got here, okay, and uh, these are the topics that uh, are uh, taught to people who go to high school, some in college as well, this is from a college level book, and you can see what kind of subjects they teach, you know, people who um, start uh, physics for the first time. And they start out by going through over the uh, geometry, you know, some of the history of how we ended up like this. And they start with the motions of the earth, measurement of time, etc. And they end up there, number nine, page 74, they start at mechanics. Okay, mechanics. Finally, we get to mechanics, okay? Hopefully, that's what physics is about, mechanics, above all, right? And they're going to do mechanics. Good, great. I love it. Let's see what they've got. Well, um, it turns out that when you go in there and look, the, these are, they have a bunch of equations. And you say, well, well, hold it. Is, is that mechanics? Is mechanics about what? Speed, distance divided by time, which we just covered a minute ago. Angular speed, number of rotations per time, velocity equal to speed plus direction and displacement. Is this mechanics? This sounds like math to me, not mechanics. Mechanics is, you know, like a car, how it works, how it runs. Give me the theory of why it moves. That's mechanics. How I pull the box up through a pulley, now that's mechanics. How a ball rolls down the inclined plane, why it falls down, in other words, what's drawing it down. But to calculate and measure and say what's the speed of the ball, is that mechanics? Okay, so you can see how the mathematicians took it all along their specialty. They said, oh, we're, we're going to do physics in this direction. We're going to do math. And they forgot about the explanations. In fact, they have no explanations even to this day for anything. For any invisible, intangible object or mechanism that Mother Nature has out there, they have no explanations whatsoever. Why? Because they never identified the invisible, intangible objects Mother Nature uses. Okay? So this is the problem. And uh, regarding that famous word energy, fortunately we have here, uh, so that we don't lose track of what energy is, we have Mr. Feynman tell us finally, you know, what energy is. And what does he say? He says in one of his lectures, he says, it is important to realize that in physics today we have no knowledge of what energy is. 
So uh, what is physics about? Energy. And what is energy? We don't know what it is, so we don't know what physics is about. But we do mechanics, and what kind of mechanics do we do? Well, we do equations. And I don't want to know equations. I want to know the mechanism. I thought that's what mechanics was about. You know, and uh, when you go there, they say, no, no, we do equations here. We don't do mechanics. We have these equations about speed and velocity and about how fast uh, light goes, but we have no mechanics. Why don't you have any mechanics? Well, because they have no idea what uh, entity underlies light. They've never figured out what light is, the structure, the architecture of what's underlying light. And so they modeled it with a bunch of particles. They modeled it with waves, transverse waves. First, they had longitudinal waves. And they ended up with this notion of what light is. And they say, well, light is something that vibrates up and down. OK, it goes up and down, right? Yeah, but we model it with little particles going straight, because light goes straight, as Newton said. And light also vibrates up and down, like Huygens said. <laughs> and how do you get something that uh, goes up and down at the same time that it goes straight? Well, the solution came in the 21st century. It's known as a rope. And you can see the bumps, the goose bumps, okay, when this torques along a straight entity, meaning really a tight, tense entity. And so now, yes, we can unify the goose bumps with something that is straight, taught in this case. Okay? A rope does mimic both uh, properties. Okay? Something that a, um, uh, particles cannot simulate anything related to waves and waves certainly do not behave anywhere like particles, especially if the wave is going up and down like a standing wave. Is the particle going up and the particle going down? Is that what's happening to the particle that constitutes the wave? Is that what we're saying? So what's taking the particle up? What's taking the particle down? And yeah, these are the questions they never answer. They just say, oh, we just do math. We, we describe with equations. And that's what we have today.